So um, I'm going to talk a little, we're going to go a little bit deeper here into a little bit of how you could, for instance, provision a really good uh, pass or a randomly pass or a generated password. I spoke a little bit to, to Spencer about uh, provisioning in the factory, and this is really what this is about. So I don't have really good names for these things. So I've used long hyphenated names. I actually have a uh, taxonomy document uh, uh, at the IETF. Um, it's kind of asking to describe some of this and maybe come up with some better names for some of this. Um, and I've done a different talk uh, related to this about uh, identity credential provisioning and trying to understand some of the criteria. And, and part of the issue of this is that um, well, I can explain this to you and you can probably explain it to some other people after this. The problem is as you go back through the supply chain on things, it gets a bit murky and then you wind up with an, uh, sometimes with an NDA that you can't get past to find out what's going on. And so that's a concern. But with that, there are essentially four different ways that I can explain on how do you are going to uh, uh, provision a new uh, a password into a device on a per dev device unique basis. So first let's, we're gonna talk about how, how not to do it, right? So we talked about that before with the Cheeto. This is how you do the Cheeto. What you do is you set the password to admin the uh, first time you boot. And afterwards you compile your code and it gets loaded into the device while it's being fabricated and that's it. Now that picture you see is called a bed of nails test. Um, it involves a protocol called JTAG, which is the Joint Task uh, Joint Test Action Group. And they have defined a set of specs that have been around for 20, probably 30 years on essentially how do we make sure that the devices that are being produced are tested well. And they literally have, a, as you can see, a, a bed of these, uh, I think they're gold-plated nails. They stick up in a particular pattern, they match conductors on the board. And there's actually a kind of vacuum system that pulls it down to make sure it gets good contact. Um, and then you can inject signals into the board. You can power it up. You can test the integrity of the solder joints. And you can actually do, uh, with JTAG, you can actually run a process where you actually can interrogate the inside of the chips. And this is used often to validate a lot of different manufacturing processes. But from the point of view of software systems point of view, the most important thing that JTAG does is that it loads your code into the device um, because this device has no other way to load code. But even if it did, even if it was, for instance, that we were building a PC motherboard and you thought, oh, well, I'm just going to put a CD in the CD-ROM or a USB key in the USB drive um, uh, connector and I'll load my operating system, you realize you need some software already on the system in order to be able to read the CD drive. So this is how that gets there. So that's dumb way is you basically just write the word admin uh, in as the password field somewhere and you're done. So, okay, so we can exploit this a little bit here better. Um, what we can do is we can generate a random number in the factory um, in a piece of equipment. We can print this out on a QR, on a sticker that we're gonna put on the bottom of the device. Maybe it has a QR code, maybe it doesn't. Um, and we're gonna then basically put this through into this JTAG be, uh, uh, bed of nails. We're gonna put that password into perhaps the non-volatile RAM that contains the settings for the device. When we do that, we're also maybe gonna put the ethernet or the Wi-Fi MAC address. So that hex series of, of 12 hex digits that you see on devices all over the place, maybe you're gonna see the serial number. All those things are supposed to be unique as well, just like the password. It's just the MAC address and the serial number tend to be uh, public information about the device. And you print it out onto the label. And then you just have to make sure the right labels go on the right, the right devices and you're, you're set. If you're off by one, it's a disaster. But you know what? Factories mostly figured that out how to do it. And they probably don't use that printer that I showed. So there's another way to do this. Um, you could have the newly fabricated device the first time it turns on and you on this bed of nails test, you could have it generate a, a password. Roll some dice, essentially some virtual dice, generate a password, put it in a special place in, in, the, in the system. And then in the bed of nails test, we could read that out from the system and we could print it. So it's a little bit different. Now, one advantage is the password or the credential Spencer, the, the private key that goes with the rest of the, the certificate 
never leaves the device. That's really kind of nice. It can't, it may be even in a part of the device that can't normally be read without a bed of nails test. And so that's a big advantage to doing things. Um, there is a downside. It turns out that if the devices don't have really good random number generators, they may generate the same password for a lot of devices. The Taiwan um, citizenship uh, card that was initially used for transit and then health and then everything in starting in 2002, apparently. Um, individually, when you looked at a lot of a thousand of them, they looked really random. But apparently when you looked at, at a million of them, uh, the public part of a million of them, that it wasn't as random as people thought. And there's a paper out there that explains this and they were able to extract many, many thousands of passwords out of these keys of these tokens that look like, uh, um, uh, well, they look like credit cards or, or smart cards or things you use on the transit. Um, and they were able to determine that it's a bit of a disaster. So there's some concern about doing this way, which is why people say, I wanna do it in the factory, not in the device. So a slightly different variation of this um, is essentially this is the same thing really, but this is kind of more applicable if it turns out that you assemble, uh, build your devices in one place, but you don't get to do, you. that's completely contracted out. They'll never let you add the password process into this, into their factory. Um, so what, what happens? Well, if it turns out that you actually receive the devices in bulk at a testing facility or something else, uh, where maybe you put the, it's something you attach the, the right language uh, manual or all the other stickers that need for, to import in a particular place. If you QA them and you're going to boot them up, you could have a secure uh, service that when the device first boots up, it uses some credentials that are built into it, some factory web service uh, credentials. And now it generates the password, posts it securely to this factory web service. Um, print uh, uh, the QR, the label, excuse me, is printed out and slapped on the, on the device and it goes on its way. Having done that, of course, now it, it, part of the reply says, okay, now turn off that. Don't ever do that again, right? Um, even if your factory reset, you never do that again. So um, that's something you can do. And, and it's quite possible that you could do this well. And that could even be happening at, at a VAR. So for instance, if you are building a device that you then ship in bulk to a VAR, they could have that environment. They could go put that through that process and then they could ship them out to the customers. So this is not as, as, as zero touch as we'd like. Um, and it's probably inappropriate for people that wanna ship their devices directly from the factory to the Amazon warehouse and then to the consumer, um, but it does happen. And I've also learned that there's actually uh, companies that have machines that do exactly this um, in a number of factories already. Um, and uh, it's an Irish company and they, they there's probably other ones um, and they do this already. And, and I was kind of startled to learn how far they are and how quiet they are about the fact that they do this. So there's a, another option and it, it's, it's kind of, a, uh, kind of a, a variation of the previous two. And increasingly what happens is that when you buy your, your chip from the vendor, um, the, your CPU, um, so maybe you buy an NXP from an ARM NXP chip, or um, maybe uh, you, you're buying a RISC-V chip or, or a whole bunch of other ones from other places. Um, um, Qualcomm was very big on doing this, for instance. Um, and what they do is on every one of those CPUs, they put essentially a password, a secret, or they call it a, a seed or a silicon root of trust. And what happens is that that's baked into the device in the silicon level, not at the, at the EEPROM or level. Um, and you then also receive a copy of it through some uh, courier, uh, secret courier. So what happens is when your device boots up, it is able to access a secret um, through a, a, a special process. And from that, it's able to derive in a deterministic way its, its initial password. You know the secret because you've been told it. And so you are able to derive that password as well uh, in the same deterministic way. You put, it, you put it on a label and the label and the device are some are, are um, uh, come together at the end of the factory process. 
So that involves no changes to your uh, assembly process where you put chips together. But in effect, what's happened is that you've just outsourced one of the two previous methods or three previous methods um, to the silicon vendor and they're doing it all for you. And then you get the results of that. So that's really great and wonderful. One of the problems with it is that it turns out that your minimum order quantity is probably at least 100,000 devices before they'll explain to you what happens. So unfortunately, it's not very usable if you are building ones and twos and because you're in prototype stage um, or uh, you just aren't at that quantity yet. So that becomes a real problem in my opinion that it doesn't scale down to the smallest guy. So one way that as well that I'm gonna discuss um, is a variation of the previous method. And you notice it's missing the magic green box, the silicon chip. So you say, well, wait a minute, I'm already programming the MAC address or somebody in my assembly is already programming the MAC address in there. And I think that that information is somewhat secret if I don't use it literally as the password. I do some uh, one-way encryption on it with some information that's only in my code. Well, I mentioned don't have passwords in your code, but let's say you do that in a sufficiently obfuscated way that you feel a little bit confident about this. And you say, okay, I'm gonna set that as my password, okay? So this is a good way, particularly if, you're, if your alternative is admin and min and you can't go back and fix your factory very well, but you could change your software relatively easily. Um, so that's a good way to get a non-deterministic password out there. The question is, we don't know, and I think there's some debate among, from what I, my communication with the people, who, the um, authors of the Etsy spec, as to whether or not this is going to pass regulation or not. I mean, it depends on what that generate password encrypt Mac, how that works. And um, it's unclear whether that is going to actually work long-term and uh, as far as the regular regulators concerned. But sure better than admin admin. And if you can implement this in a month, please do. Um, and then figure out how to do it, do it better afterwards. So not including that last little hack, this is a kind of a comparison of the different methods um, and what are the risks and benefits. And the major one is basically who, who has access to the passwords, but uh, then also how reliably can you know that they are actually um, uh, random and what is the effect of them not being random.